and we've been watching the microbiome rush in. The, um, uh, so let me give a little bit of a cartography view about, um, about uh, the microbiome. Uh, a, a few years ago, we had the first big looks at the composition of the microbiome, and you know, the way that it felt just a few years ago is a bit like this. Now, uh, we've been hearing the last two days uh, some splendid uh, summaries of what happened from HMP, MetaHIT, and so much work that's been done uh, in addition around the world about, uh, but, but basically based in the NIH portfolio on these areas. And of course, we, uh, the, the large-scale compositional features of the microbiome are understood. Uh, we know something about the inter-individual variation of the microbiota. Uh, we know a, a little bit, or we're beginning to understand what the questions are about how to think about diet and uh, microbial composition. And we've learned a bit about, uh, uh, about how it changes during the lifespan, which is very important for understanding physiology and also for designing uh, studies with regard to disease. Now, what I'm going to do is um, summarize um, the, where I think we're going this morning in three ways. First of all, some, some highlights of uh, disease association studies that have really influenced me, and some of which we'll be hearing about this morning. Um, and I think that they fall into a few categories of thinking about how the microbiome becomes a translational agent in disease biology. Uh, then we'll also, uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of my taste about functional ecology, which I know has been brought up early in the meeting as well, but I think it's very important in thinking about how to frame uh, what we should be studying about the microbiome in order to understand its contribution to disease and how to intervene. And then finally, some, uh, some conceptual questions about how one would actually carry out interventions. So first of all, the hit and run idea, uh, again, I was, uh, I don't believe this was covered um, uh, in, the, in the previous discussions, but I think what's really important is um, we think about the microbiome as being a group of guys that make some very important products which could affect their physiology and in, in some cases in the disease manner. But uh, something which has really lingered with me, and we'll hear a bit more about this morning, um, is that there's a hit and run effect that the microbiome can play, meaning that at certain points in life, particularly in early life, the products of the microbiome can affect the, the physiology of us at a unique window of time. And so even if later on your microbiome totally changes, or if you at that point decide to therapeutically modify it, it might not matter because that unique impact that it had on our physiology or disease biology has already taken place. And so an example of that, which we'll be hearing about in a bit, I believe, from, uh, from Marty Blazer, is, um, is how uh, early in your early encounters with the microbiome really shapes your lifelong physiology. So uh, I think that's going to be quite an important story. And um, a second, uh, which is, is about uh, windows of time and where the immune system is modified by encounter with the microbiome. And one example which I'm highlighting here is, uh, is how the formation and activity in variant NKT cells, which are quite important in asthma and, uh, and perhaps in colitis, are, um, uh, uh, their formation is really dependent on the presence and the type of microbiome in that window of life. And even if you wait uh, in mice a few weeks later and now do your modification, the effect has already taken place. So window of time, receptive group of organisms in the body, and so, of course, that's going to be quite important to studying whether or not organisms have a disease and what to do about it. Um, we'll um, also be hearing about uh, another thing about, like, uh, I guess, good and bad guys. So this is the second idea. The, the classic clinical microbiology idea is that there's particular organisms that are making particular products which are, are an issue for us in terms of disease state. And um, uh, Stan Hasen's group and, and that group of collaborators have come up with a remarkable story that uh, trimethylamine metabolizing organisms will, uh, will release that metabolite, 
and that metabolite actually affects physiology related to atherosclerosis. And so there was really uh, a number of, been a number of studies on this, but some elegant ones just this past year on the, uh, the formation of, uh, of this critical metabolite, which happens in most of us on a Western diet. But if, you're, uh, if you ingest antibiotics for a short period of time, then you're not making that metabolite. And a crossover study, you can restore that uh, after uh, you've done. So it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's that me metabolism is dependent on, the or on our organisms. Um, people who are omnivores have, it, have those organisms. People who are vegans, uh, uh, at least some don't. And uh, the formation of this metabolite uh, has been studied, revealed in a number of studies, affects uh, Metab uh, affects risk of, of uh, atherosclerotic disease and perhaps other physiology related to uh, bad cardiovascular outcome, presumably because of the effect of the oxidized form of trimethylamine, which, uh, which then becomes a bioactive end product. So we'll be hearing more about that story. There's trimethylamine being oxidized. Uh, second issue, which we've heard a good deal about, is C. difficile. And of course, there's two ways to think about the physiology of that disease. One of them is we know that that organism is, is uh, making uh, uh, exotoxins, which are important for causing the colitis. You could also think about it as an environmental disease, where you've degraded the environment, which has allowed the bloom of those organisms. Uh, and so you could think of it either as a niche problem or as, as a bad guy problem. I've chosen in this case to highlight the one, but it's certainly important to share the, the other. And so the idea has been to restore the microbiome using simple things like fecal uh, transplant. And this is, I think, important for proof of concept, but we're all looking forward to more sophisticated ways to approach this. Um, and so if there's really a, a deficit, or like a, some guys which are are taking care of the habitat in a way that doesn't permit uh, C. difficile to bloom or carry out its function, then what you'd like to do is restore those organisms either, um, either by putting the exact ones back in or something which is biologically equivalent. And uh, uh, I was very much of a fan of this study which uh, came, which was reported just about a year ago, which actually took the effort in a mouse model to uh, to work through in a systematic way organisms which could fill that hole in the ecosystem and hence prevent uh, the uh, C. difficile bloom. And uh, from this, actually, a, a relatively small number of organisms were identified that could do that. And I presume that this area will, will refine and we'll see this as a way to, uh, first of all, diagnose people that have the ecosystem problem and then some ideas of what to do about it. Now, one of, um, one of, the, uh, of the highlights of the microbiome, really, since the beginning, has been its role in energy metabolism. And there's been a good deal of discussion about that. And with regard to obesity, the effects are direct and indirect, or cause and effect, because the organisms eat what we eat. And so if we have a diet which promotes obesity, then there'll be different organisms because of that. But there's been very elegant work which has demonstrated that um, that the, the organisms actually, they and their energy metabolism drives the obesity state, or for that matter, the malnourished state. Um, and so we'll be hearing uh, uh, a bit more about that and how to intervene on it. And uh, I wanted to uh, call out this example because I think it points out an interesting issue about how to target the microbiome with regard to obesity. So if you say that you have organisms which are, say, if your issue is obesity, and you want to target organisms which are promoting that state, then um, uh, one idea which was tested here was to use uh, complex carbohydrates to shift the community of organisms to make it less favorable for those ones which are known to be contributing to the obesity state in the, in the, um, in the first world model. Uh, and so you could, so the, so here's an example of how this goes, where you start at this, uh, this weight state, and with a regular high-fat diet, uh, obesity or uh, body weight, or for that matter, uh, uh, non-lean weight and so on goes up. Uh, but if you, uh, 
if, and if you have it a lean body weight, then uh, a lean fat diet, uh, uh, you, uh, you actually go down in weight. But you could, even on a high fat diet, using co complex carbohydrates, you could avert at least the increase, which is very cool. The, um, the thing, though, is you're not actually making things quite the same, because if, ooh, excuse me, if you look at compositional analysis, and this is a sort of a PCA type of analysis, that, um, that the, uh, uh, the normal microbial community, which would be sort of this cluster, uh, doesn't, doesn't get restored when you put back complex carbohydrates. But it's just functionally, it's different. And so what we need to think about is, well, is that satisfactory biologically, or have we created or are we looking at other sorts of risks? And so I think that's going to be a very interesting thing to challenge, to monitor exactly how we're changing the microbiome as we carry out an intervention and to determine whether or not it's beneficial or not in the larger sense. Now, I think a really exciting uh, area, quite surprising to, to many of us, has been the, the relationship between the microbiome and behavior. Um, and uh, that's been studied in some elegant ways in mice and to a certain extent in people. We'll be hearing uh, the first uh, 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 data-focused, fully data-focused talk is going to be uh, taking an overview of that. And one thing which I want to call out, partly because, uh, because of our, our pride in, in Los Angeles, and I see Emron Mayers here, is, uh, is, the, is studies of, of emotional tone in individuals which are simply getting the products of uh, microbial products, and you change the, the uh, intake of that in basically a crossover design. And you could watch, and then you challenge those individuals with an adverse visual, emotional visual stimulus, and you look at their, uh, at their response to that using fMRI, and actually the microbial products will change the emotional tone of those individuals. So, um, I think this is a very exciting area. Obviously, it's a very complex area to study, but one that points out the breadth of the physiology and, uh, and behavioral disease being such an important issue um, in the world that the microbiome might be affecting that. Now, um, we think about microbial effects being local, uh, but they also can be systemic in interesting ways, and one of them which I was just calling out is the relationship of microbiome to behavior. But another one, surprisingly, is this relationship to, to things like lymphoma risk. And this is uh, one example using uh, looking at individuals at risk for lymphoma because they have genetic problems with DNA damage. And so they go on to things like lymphoma at, at an early age, people with ataxic telangiectasia, and a number of those other. Uh, genetic problems with DNA repair, most of those individuals will die from lymphoma, or in other cases, uh, typically it's leukemia in their uh, early uh, second to third decade of life. Uh, now, the surprising thing is that when we st study this actually collaboratively at UCLA, we're surprised to find out that in this uh, genetic disease, uh, where there's 100 percent penetrance in deaths with lymphoma, we found that if you change the mouse house, that those mice did not get lymphoma for a very long time instead of uh, acquiring the disease uh, at, a, at an early age and then going on to death. It was actually the lymphoma uh, uh, uptake uh, occurred more like a year of age, and actually most of the mice died of old age rather than dying of lymphoma. This is very exciting because no, no one had imagined that these sorts of diseases were any less than 100 percent penetrant cancer phenotype. And uh, what's interesting is that, uh, the, that when we tracked this down, it was related to the microbial composition of those mice. And uh, the microbial composition changed just the physiologic burden of genotoxicity, DNA damage that was occurring in lymphocytes or any uh, any immune cell types in, throughout the mouse, not just in the gut, but throughout the mouse, day by day. So this is the level of damage, of DNA damage in a regular lymphocyte um, having basically sort of a, a, a Rockville or a Maryland diet, but it, with a Malawi or Amerindian diet <laughs> equivalent. 
uh, those microbiota uh, are driving a, a lower level of DNA damage. And uh, we've actually studied a good deal what are, the, what's the, what are the products of the microorganisms, how they're eliciting certain cytokines which drive that systemic uh, constitutive level of DNA damage. It's not a problem to most of us because we repair our DNA damage. But for individuals who have difficulties with that, then that puts you at risk for uh, going on to lymphoma. And so we did actually careful analysis to identify the organisms that were different in those two consorts of, of uh, microbial communities to identify the ones which were promoting um, um, DNA damage or the ones which were actually protecting against it. And from that, we were able to identify a, a number of candidates for each, which are the physiologic ones. And uh, the nice thing is if you put uh, the ones which are protective back into a regular mouse, then you uh, reduce the amount of DNA damage and you reduce the accumulation, uh, the onset of lymphoma. So it's quite exciting. One could imagine that, that basically eating, uh, in this case it was a lactobacillus strain, was a single organism which could make a difference. And one could imagine that that sort of intervention might be beneficial for people who are at risk for this, and that would be, could be the equivalent of a yogurt diet. And so, um, so I think this is something which we'll have to look at in terms of bad and good guy physiology for, um, for microbial composition but also ways in which one could target particular organisms to intervene. Now, there's another more complex way to think about the microbial community and how it affects disease susceptibility, and that's at the ecosystem level and uh, work by many, and I know that David Roman was listed to highlight that, is to think about the ecosystem issues in the microbiome. And, and inflammatory bowel disease is a good example of that, where we know that it's a complex microbial composition, which is associated with disease penetrance. Um, and uh, here I've called out an example of work uh, uh, by a group of individuals, and this one was led by Curtis Huttenhauer, which identified how the microbial composition uh, indicated by this, uh, this, this individual, uh, this, this aggregate matrix of, uh, of, of a, a PicoA type of data representation that the composition in normal individuals might be down here, but you, there's sort of a, a microbial succession which occurs as you go from uh, a non-disease state into increasing disease activity. And uh, that, those differences in those sort of ecosystem differences are also uh, associated with, uh, and this is a study of, of, of humans, so it's actually a quite uh, impressive study that uh, if you look at uh, epidemiologically at lifestyle traits which relate to, uh, which are known to be disease susceptibility factors in IBD, that you actually find that those, some of those environmental factors are also related to changing the uh, microbial composition. So this is uh, uh, quite exciting in terms of seeing a coherence between susceptibility traits and uh, the disease phenotype. But then we have to ask, uh, how much of this is related to, uh, to driving the disease and how much of it uh, is, uh, is related to uh, a response to disease? And those both might be relevant in terms of intervention, but, but of course some of them which are secondary might not be then a useful therapeutic target for intervention. So this is a very big challenge right now uh, I think in any sort of study of microbial composition and disease, uh, this is a bit of a, of a summary of that, uh, showing some of the microbial taxa which are associated with, with uh, disease states. But I think what this comes to is the issue about, about correlation causation. It's a, it's a famous issue in philosophy for the last few hundred years, and so I called out uh, 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 this, uh, this work, and this is B Bishop Barclay was the one who had written the one that I had to study in college, and actually I've been fond of it ever since. But it does point out some uh, ways that we could approach it by being very careful about cohort design, uh, understanding habitat, but probably most importantly, finding ways to intervene to validate that, that particular organisms or ecosystems are important. 
And um, there was a great, wonderful study by George uh, Suchihara from uh, the Scripps Oceanographic Institute, which, which studied bioinformatically this classic problem. People, I guess, when you look at coastal fisheries, there's this succession relationship be back and forth between sardines and anchovies. And you see this all around the world. And so uh, in, ocean, uh, in uh, marine biology, the question is, is this a causal relationship or uh, is this the, just a correlation? And uh, some very new computational biology was presented in this paper to, uh, to, to argue whether or not it was. And so I'd like a vote from everybody. Um, how many of you would say that this is a causal relationship? And how many would say it's, it's correlation? Everybody has to vote. So who says that it's causal? Okay, some bold individuals. Causal, and who says that it's correlation? Okay, we have, that seems to be the vote. We're a democratic country. And uh, actually, the computational biology says that it's, uh, that it's correlation. So congratulations. The, this shows the wisdom of the crowd. But, um, <laughs> but actually, we don't know because it's computational biology. <laughs> I didn't really mean that. I, I, I can't admire it more, th more than anybody could. So, uh, so I guess in summary, uh, this is how I feel where we are right now, uh, that, that we've uh, gone from understanding there's a new hemisphere to getting some idea about what it looks like and a little bit about what's inside. But of course, there's a lot more to be done. Now, um, uh, one guide for me about where we should be going in this is to thinking about the ecosystem with regard to function as opposed to just composition. And uh, the way that I'd, uh, this, I, I, this sort of data I'm sh sure has been showed during the, the, this last day or so, this is just the composition of, of about 100 different individuals. These are healthy individuals, and this just demonstrates the remarkable variation that each of us has, because this, these are all normal, but you can see how different it is. Now, that may be biologically important, may not. Certainly in things like in the, in the vaginal microenvironment, we know that composition can be very tightly related to function. But, in, uh, but it's not necessarily the case. And the, the way, when I look at composition, I sort of think about this, it's like looking at the UPC codes. Imagine if we went into a grocery store and all we could see is cans with UPC codes, but we didn't know what was inside the cans. It would be sort of tough to know what to buy to make a good meal. And, um, and I think also we know that one of the difficulties with phylogeny is that, that uh, at the phylogenetic level there could be such diversity. Partly that's related to, uh, to uh, acquired traits, and we've heard a bit about, uh, about phage and other sorts of things, strain differences. But even apart from that, just at the genus level, there's remarkable difference in function. All the vegetables that you see in that beautiful image of, from Whole Foods or something like that, is, um, uh, those are all from the same genus. And so it gives you an idea of the remarkable diversity of function that could be captured at the level of a single genus. And here is just an example of a single species, the remarkable difference in function and proficiency that one could have. So um, what that really begs us to do is to figure out methodologies to study uh, ecosystems or uh, groups of organisms with regard to function rather than their phylogeny. And uh, I've just I pulled this, uh, in a number of these, I've pulled these examples from Curtis Hutton, how I want to acknowledge uh, uh, s some of his presentations of this. And what I wanted to point out uh, is, that, uh, is that the composition uh, at the phylogenetic level is actually a bit more simple to analyze when you look at it at, at the metagenomic level, there's more uh, homogeneity at a particular uh, site in healthy individuals uh, uh, at the metagenomic level. And at the transcripts, it also is somewhat uh, less noisy. Uh, uh, and, and transcripts are, or would be the expressed part. And meta, metaproteomic level is still being done. And I know that Janet Jansen's here, who's done some important work 
to, uh, to try and capture for the actual produced products uh, and for that matter metabolites, which I'll comment on in a moment. So the, the point then is that there are ways to study uh, the proficiencies at the genetic level, but actually the products of the microbiome. And that would seem to be a very important place to look, since it's really the products of the organisms rather than their names which are driving our physiology or disease state. An example of how uh, uh, members of a consortium of, of, of people that I've been working with have been studying this is to uh, uh, do endoscopy on, on humans, take colonic samples, and we've done uh, about 300 individuals where we've actually just washed different parts of the mucosal surface endoscopically, collected the washes from those different sites, and then we've looked at a bunch of things. We've looked at the OTUs, looked, looked at microbial composition, and then using uh, uh, imputed metagenome, determine what the proficiencies are for, uh, for the production, of, uh, uh, production and activities. And then also take those very same samples and look to see what was actually being made locally with regard to metabolites and proteins. And when you do that, uh, one thing that's very cool, and this is where, you know, computational biology can be quite lovely, is, uh, is that if you look at the 2,000 or so OTUs, and you look at, uh, at uh, about 2,000 different metabolites, and you just do a correlation analysis, you find that a few hundred organisms and a few hundred metabolites are actually co closely correlated. And so a lot of them aren't, but the ones that are, you can see by this heat map, that uh, a lot of them really go together. And um, when we analyze this in terms of the microbial composition, uh, so again, what we're doing is we're taking a few hundred samples, and each one we know the microbial composition phylogenetically. And then we, add, we know the proteins that are made, and we know the metabolites that are being made. And we ask, what are the ones that really go together? If we looked at the bacterial and the human proteins, uh, my, b bacterial composition and human proteins, there's a little bit of relatedness, but not that much. This is sort of a network schematic. So there's a certain amount of guys that tend to cluster together, but not so much. At the level of human proteins and metabolites, really very little. But look at this. If you look at the interactome of, the, of all the small molecules in the gut and, uh, and the bacterial composition, you find a very rich interactome. And so that would indicate that the two things. One is a great deal of the small molecules that are present in the lumen of the gut are actually not pr what you ate or products of, uh, that are being released by your intestinal mucosal lining, even though that's a massive uh, site for secretion. But it's actually products of, that are formed by that stuff from the microbiota. And since a lot of those are bioactive, it would be very important to analyze them. And so here's an example of, uh, of, of a data set of, of a heat map of metabolites which are associated with the Crohn's disease, disease state, or ulcerative colitis, or healthies. And I think you could appreciate that at this sort of like 10,000 foot view, that there are big differences in the metabolite features of individuals in a healthy state or in a Crohn's or UC state. And it's quite interesting that these individuals were all taken from individuals who had minimal inflammatory disease. So now that they felt good, and they were endoscopically normal. So this is just sort of the underlying difference in metabolic, uh, or actually this is, this is metagenomic, I'm sorry, this is at the metagenomic level. So there is a difference in the production, uh, the capabilities of the organisms in these different uh, uh, disease states. Uh, this is from, again, from uh, Curtis Huttenhauer's a consortium, and this is taking a similar sort of data and pointing out that, uh, that if you look at that data set, it actually is fairly coherent that some of the products of microorganisms or capabilities of proficiency of the microorganisms in the disease state or in the healthy state are fairly different. So you're really selecting for organisms which are capable of different things, making different things, and some of those products are 
are reasonably likely to drive those disease states or to be interfering with things which might be healthy. For example, the decline of organisms that make uh, free fatty acids, which are known to be an important source of, of energy metabolism that are required for the healthy epithelium, and the organisms that are making that are depleted in IPT. Now, let's think for a moment about inflammatory bowel disease. And most diseases that we are all concerned about have a genetic feature to them. IBD is one of the ones that have been very well studied for that. There's 163 genes which are known to be players. Probably each individual maybe has a dozen or two that are the players for that. And they fall into different categories of function. But what's interesting is that if you look at those 163 loci, and if you just ask in healthy individuals whether those disease polymorphisms uh, are related to your microbial composition, it turns out that a lot of them are. So the, here's a Manhattan plot of, uh, of, uh, of the, basically, you might say these are the 163 loci. And what we've done is done basically a QTL analysis to ask what is, are there organisms or concerts of organisms whose abundance are different depending on your disease uh, allele polymorphism. And so I think you can appreciate that, that um, many of these loci are associated with significant hits where they're changing microbial composition in normal individuals. So this raises the idea that some of these uh, disease polymorphisms, they might actually be playing a role because they're, they have they're changing your ability to garden your microorganisms, and hence the microbial composition or their production are putting you at risk. And so we've actually looked at an example of that. And here I'll just show you uh, one. We know that there's a set of genes which are associated with inflammatory bowel disease, which are genes which are involved in the formation of glycans, of, of the mucin glycans. And mucin, of course, is the, is the, product, is the protective layer uh, uh, throughout the gut and in other mucosa that have a big effect in host microbial interaction. And so what we asked was, one of these disease polymorphisms which is associated with Crohn's disease, it, it turns out that there's a null po polymorphism that 16% of, of healthy individuals, so 16% of you people, uh, actually have a null polymorphism of foot two, so you, you don't have terminal fucose on your oglycans. And the reason for that is that some organisms that are bad, like Helicobacter, like fucose, and they bind to it, and that allows them to be a pathogen. And so if you are, have a null polymorphism for fucose, you don't have a problem with Helicobacter. But you do have a problem with organisms which like a terminal galactose, which is what's left when you don't have the terminal fucose. So you have to sort of choose your poison. And, 16%, and so we have different populations around the world that probably because of, of infectious disease uh, burdens have that difference. So this is, uh, so it's secreted or non-secreted are, are FUT2 positive or FUT2 negative, and you can make mice that are the same way. And what we've done is we've analyzed the microbial composition and function, and it turns out that there's actually uh, quite a concordance between mice and humans in how you garden your microorganisms, your whole microbiome depending on FUT2, and they're largely concordant. And what we've done is we've analyzed it also at the level of metagenome and metabolites. And we find out that, again, between mouse and humans, even though their microbial composition is fairly different, we find that their composition is, uh, is, is actually dictated by your FUTU state. And in a significant manner, in terms of ones which go up, functions which go up, and functions which go down depending on FUT2. And the majority of these differences are the same ones that you see in IBD. So this is a correlation, but it's actually quite cool. So disease, even with people that don't have the FUT2 state, uh, the way you garden your organisms with regard to IBD, the way that you garden them with regard to this one disease polymorphism are concordant, which suggests that this might be a genetic trait which changes out organisms in a way that are bringing in uh, functions and products which might be deleterious and put you at a closer threshold for disease. 
So way to think about that, that, uh, that, that the genetics of the host are, uh, are changing your microbial composition, uh, your, uh, uh, what you eat and the intake of products are affect the organisms as well. And the end result, and maybe this is the business end of thinking about microbial community or what their functions and products are, which then are affecting the host state and whether it's pushing you closer or away from a threshold for disease. So what does this mean in terms of analyzing the microbiome with regard to disease and ideas for intervention? Well, first of all, uh, this certainly emphasizes the idea of ecology in the microbiome, which I know has been an important theme for uh, this meeting. And, uh, and so it points out that we should be trying to embrace ecologic analysis as opposed to individual organisms as a way to think about the microbiome and particularly think about it with regard to disease states. Um, we uh, also know that the functionality of the microbiome is going to be as informative or perhaps in some way particularly illustrative uh, or uh, explanatory for how microbial composition is, a, is driving disease states. And it makes sense mechanistically because microbial products, uh, organisms, I mean, we, our problem with diseases aren't their names, but our problems with organisms or the benefit that we get from organisms are what they're doing. So what does that mean for intervention? Well, at a simple level, it's that, well, you find out what are the pathobionts, the, or the deleterious organisms, find a way to deplete them, or find a way to add back beneficial organisms. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I think a more uh, elegant way to think about it is how we could consider targeting functions. So not worrying about changing in or out organisms, but changing the function of them. And so if we know that pathway number 27 is a particular biochemical pathway which is beneficial or deleterious, then you could imagine that we could eat something uh, that would drive the pathways to change them in a way which is desirable. Or maybe the way that we take drugs like a, a COX-2 inhibitor to block that pathway to block the formation of, a, of an undesirable product we can imagine treating the microbiome sort of in the way we treat our own physiology, which is to block a particular pathway using a drug which is, uh, which is desirable or undesirable. So this gets me to the radio um, metaphor. Um, th this, I think, is a pretty famous article that was a polemical article that came out in Cancer Cell uh, about a decade ago, which is talking about what's the problem with biologists trying to study systems and disease states. And so the metaphor that he used was, what would happen if, if a bi biologist was presented with a radio and need to determine what was it, why was it wrong, and how to fix it? And so the way that a biologist would do it is that they would, they would uh, rip it up and take a look at what's inside of it, and they'd first see that there's all these components. And they'd write all these papers in Nature saying that there's red components and blue components and things like that. And so you've sort of discovered what the radio is. You know, it has all these components. And then people would say, well, you know, it's really not that. The functions are doing, the, the, uh, the, the components are doing something. And so then you start building pathways. And the way that you do pathways is that you find out that certain components, like the MIC, like it's called a microphone, but it's a MIC, it's a, it, it, I forget what the acronym was that, uh, that he used, but you find a few components that if one of those is absent, then the radio doesn't work. And so you start building up a pathway of the radio uh, where you have sound expression coming out. So this is, again, you know, how, how you do it. But you could keep doing this for years and years, and, and then you find out there's the other elements of the pathway, and there's more science paper, and then s cell papers, and reviews, and, and all of this stuff. But you still end up with studying, understanding the radio as a, as a pathway. And you still don't know really what the radio is or how to fix it. And so the, the comparison to that is how an engineer would look at a, at, uh, at a radio and instead consider it to, as, as a system 
where how the things are wired and, and how they relate one to another. And so the way to design, define an electrical system and what it's doing is by, uh, by an integrated, by, decided as a system as opposed to components or pathways. And so that metaphor made me think of, uh, of the, uh, of, of uh, the ecosystem analysis, where uh, an ecosystem is a way to think about the microbiome not as a set of components like microbial taxa, or even as pathways, as I was describing, well, there's these uh, metabolite number 27 is up or down, but instead to think about this as an integrated system, each one of these is a stable state. And you can have different states of the microbiome, which are robust, and, and you could bang them around with diet and what have you, but they'll stay in that state. But the, the, what this uh, ecologic state is doing and its products are going to be fairly different from this one. And one or the other might be favorable, unfavorable, depending on, uh, on your genetics or what have you. So the challenges are to dis define what is that state, that that uh, probably the best way to think of it is an ecosystem. And then the other big challenge is to understand how you can navigate between states. What's the interventions that you could do? So it's more challenging than just to define the states because the process of getting from this state to this state is going to be tough. What are the things to, to make this state unstable? And how do you make sure you come over to this rather than to maybe a third state over here, which is even worse than the one that you were in? So we need robust knowledge of the ecosystem uh, networks uh, to define what are these stable ecologic states and how to navigate between them. We uh, also need to conceive what are the ecosystem problems that we're trying to fix. Is it a hit and run problem where the way that you need to study is different because you have to look at a particular window of time? Is it a broken or altered component? So the ecosystem is okay, but maybe a particular guy is a bad behavior in that system. And, uh, uh, or is it going to be a wrong ecosystem? And so I've given examples of each of those. Now, defining an ecosystem, uh, this gets into network biology, where we really need to work closely with our bioinformatic colleagues to try and understand uh, 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 whether we're seeing, and by our clinical colleagues, to carefully design uh, studies which allow us to determine if it's cause and effect, and if the targets that are best used to define the ecosystem state or to modify it is to target the hubs uh, the hubs of a network or the causal nodes, those particular organisms, their products, one or the other might turn out to be more beneficial, more desirable or effective. So that would be a big challenge us for going ahead. And then we'll, of course, need the right analytics, robust sampling, uh, and uh, the pre-analytic platforms. And we had a wonderful, a uh, few of us, a bunch of us were together last night talking about what we need to do to really distill uh, reliable ways to make these data so that as everybody's doing them, they'll be consistent enough that we'll be able to compare our data one to the next. Quantitative ecosystems and then components. And so what I hope cartographically is we'll end up with, uh, with something that looks like this rather than the ancient things. And I'd finally like to acknowledge the people that have been, uh, that have contributed to some of the work that I was, uh, that I was associated with, and a lot we'll be hearing about a bit more for the rest of the morning. So thanks very much. We're a little bit behind time, but maybe we have time for one question quickly. Morning. So um, today the theme is translation in the microbiome, and I think uh, it's it's uh, a great pleasure for me to introduce um, 
uh, Jess Goodman, who's uh, the chief scientist of the FDA. So it's a very appropriate uh, speaker for, for the, the, this morning session. Um, Jess, uh, Dr. Goodman has been uh, the chief scientist of the FDA since 2009. He's um, in his prior uh, role from 2003 to 2009, he was actually the, the director of uh, the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, known as CBER. Uh, so again, very appropriate for anybody who works on probiotic, for example, that's one of your contact there at, uh, at FDA. So Dr. Goodman received his, uh, his MD from uh, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and he did his uh, residency and fellowship uh, training at the University of Pennsylvania and at uh, UCLA. And um, he's still a, an active infectious disease uh, physician or practicing active uh, uh, infectious disease physician. And uh, he's worked uh, from uh, bed to bedside um, uh, to really now in his role as a uh, big picture uh, public health uh, science. And um, uh, he's been and he still is a big proponent of uh, scientific excellence, I think, regulatory research and science-based regulation and public health at the FDA. So he has pretty strong ties to innovator, innovation uh, uh, people, and obviously um, uh, to NIH and uh, uh, kind of uh, cater that relationship between FDA and NIH. So uh, Dr. Goodman is going to talk about the microbiome getting to product that benefit people. Dr. Goodman. 